Everyone around me in my life told me that I would have a better life when I came to San Francisco. So many trans people come here like refugees from other cities in the United States. As a Black trans woman, as a teenager in San Francisco, I learned very quickly that while San Francisco affirmed me legislatively, socially, I had walked into job interviews and been laughed at. I had been spit on on the street. In a lot of ways, we've been dehumanized and we've been denied access and discriminated against in many, many ways. When we talk about trans women of color, there are so many layers of oppression that they have to deal with. We realized that if we didn't do something, that the Tenderloin was quickly going to become gentrified and our history was going to be completely erased. If I could describe the Transgender Cultural District in one sentence, it would be for us, by us. I think the Transgender District affirms that rich history and gives trans people and, and the broader public access to those moments in history that I think define gay and trans liberation that we know today and the freedoms that we have. I think the work that's happening in the Transgender District is, is laying a foundation for transgender-owned businesses and for transgender people to have housing and be in a area that celebrates their existence and their lives and provides opportunity. What trans people have to look forward to is having um, a place where they, they can come to and say like, you know, this is for me. What's Guy Fieri doing at the... Great, thank you. I just want to welcome everyone to our Pride Month. You will see us. I see some folks who have joined us. There's some others who are already in. So I just want to welcome everyone. Um, this is our monthly virtual justice event celebrating Pride. My name is Eric Arguello. I'm the advocacy manager for Glide under the Center for Social Justice. Uh, but before we begin, I want, in, want to introduce our Community Engagement Manager, Goulette Mousset, who will read the land acknowledgement. And Goulette's going to be jumping in also with us, asking some questions down the line. So, Goulette, it's all yours. Thank you, Eric. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitu Shaloni, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Rame Tushaloni have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten the responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Rame Tush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first people. Thank you so much. Uh, today, we're going to be celebrating the Black and Brown trans women in leadership within the trans community uh, for their role in the LGBTQ movement and history, but not just in the past, but also today. Uh, we have a great panel of educators, historians, and activists whose work continues today in paving the road to inclusion, equity, and raising its voice for the future. We will ask our panelists a series of questions, and if the audience has any questions, Please include them in the chat and we will get to three of them in the end. And that's if we have enough time. So with that, I wanna introduce our first panelist, uh, Jupiter Berraza, uh, Director of Social Justice and Empowerment Initiatives at the Transgender District. Welcome Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter currently serves as Director of Social Justice and Empowerment Initiatives of the Transgender District. In 2021, she led the initiative to designate August as Transgender History Month in the city and county of San Francisco, ushering in the nation's first commemorative month for transgender history in commemoration of the Compton's Cafeteria Rights 
of 1966. Next, we have Shane Zaldivar, Manager of Training and Education Office of Transgender Initiatives. Welcome, Shane. Uh, Shane has been in charge of designing, designing training for city and county employees since 2020. Since then, she has trained thousands of employees across different departments and offices on topics related tra to transgender communities. She was also the lead for the release of the Transgender 101 Strengthen Your Commitment to Inclusion training module, which is accessible to all CCSF employees through SF Learning in the employee portal. Outside of her work, uh, outside of o OTI, Shane has acted as a lead role in the historical and immersive play, The Compton's Cafeteria Riot. Shane is also a performer known in the local scene as the pop-up drag queen, where you can catch her in sparkles dancing in front of the ferry building on select weekends. I have to see that. And last but not least, we have Andrea Horn, community engagement and uh, trans historian. Uh, she works at the Curry Senior Center. Uh, Andrea is a former actress, model, jazz singer, and a longtime San Francisco resident. Again, she currently is the community engagement coordinator at the Curry Senior Center and previously worked with several LGBTQ community organizations. Andrea has lived and worked in San Francisco for over 40 years, supporting transgender women in the Tenderloin. Andrea is passionate about black trans history. She is writing a book on the subject, currently focusing on black trans women who lived from 1836 to 1936. So again, thank you and welcome all of you guys here with us tonight. Uh, we're really honored to have such a great panel with a lot of experience um, and, and history in the trans community and uh, a lot of the movers and shakers currently. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the questions. The first one, it is Pride Month. You know, what are we celebrating? You know, what does pride mean to you? Uh, and what do you think we are still missing for this celebration? You can take them one at a time or just talk about them all at once, however you like. So why don't we start with uh, with Jupiter? What are we celebrating this month? Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for having me, um, Glide. And I'm also very honored to be here alongside uh, Shane um, and Ms. Horn as well. Um, I did want to say that uh, for Pride, I do believe that we are celebrating self-actualization. Uh, we're celebrating liberation, um, fearlessness, um, and also unwavering courage. Um, what Pride means to me personally is all of that. Um, but also, you know, I hope that Pride also serves as a reminder that, you know, we must always refute anyone or anything that perpetuates oppression, violence, and inequality. And that's not just for pride, but it should definitely be for 365 days a year. Um, so that's what I would say is uh, what we are celebrating and also what pride means to me. And uh, what, do you what do you think is missing in the celebration, if anything? Um, I definitely think that the aspects that I mentioned is definitely missing. I, you know, over time, I, I do believe that pride in a way has become commodified to, you know, please the general masses. Uh, you know, we're seeing an influx of corporations having a stake um, in pride celebrations. Um, and I think that that is a manifestation and a testament that the real essence of pride, that it was in fact um, a riot, is becoming sort of washed in capitalism in a way. Um, and because so, it has become something that originally was not intended mm -hmm. to be. Um, so that is what I would say is missing from pride celebrations. Sure. It's putting a dollar on the movement. Correct. How about you, Shane? What are your thoughts? What are we um, celebrating? So I think one thing to celebrate 
this year in particular is just being able to gather. Like I think the past few years, there's been a lot of uncertainties and some of those still exist for our community. But I think, you know, being able to connect with people who are within your community, being able to just share the company of those who are, you know, LGBTQ is something that, you know, I think people who have fought for this movement couldn't even imagine at some point, right? Um, I think it's important to know that even by being able to gather that, in my opinion, that is an act of activism alone, you know, being able to gather and being able to be together in community. Um, I think for me, what pride means for me, you know, I think pride is something that happens, like Jupiter said, every day, mm -hmm. you know, while we focus in on June and it's a great time to highlight the different accomplishments that got us this far. I think pride for me is just something I carry, you know, when I'm doing the work that I do and understanding that it took so much work to get here, you know, never allowing myself to forget that and maybe finding ways to remind community of, of that or those outside of the community because it took so much work just to be able to have an opportunity like this, you know, where we can have an open conversation about trans experiences or, or you know, what, what being proud means to trans, but being proud means for a trans person. Um, I think one of the questions you asked to what's missing, I think for me, uh, what's missing is allyship from those outside of the community year round. I think sometimes pride gives people an invitation to, you know, celebrate and hit the clubs and all of that. But I think more importantly, some of that allyship needs to exist throughout the year um, because there's so much attacks that are still happening, you know? And I think if we had the power of those outside of the community being just as loud the rest of the year with us, um, we could see some really impactful changes. Um, but all that being said, I am happy that there will be some in-person celebration and I'm excited to do that with my community here in the city. Great, thank you, Shane. Yes, we do have a lot of work to do. Um, Andrea? What is pride? Uh, yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, waiting my turn. And I um, I remember I was a teenager when I went to my first pride, but we called it gay day. And so, and then it was, so, it was like so hippie and sort of quaint and it ended up in Golden Gate Park and everybody took off their top and um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, the whole, I, I, I struggle with pride, you know, just because, um, you know, our, our culture, uh, you know, wants to take our pride from us and let us tell us that we're nothing. And so I, I guess just um, being able to um, gather, like Shane said, I, I think I, I'm proud of that. Yeah, I'm very proud of that. So thank okay. you. No, thank you. Um, so on kind of the same line, you know, um, you know, there, you know, pride is, is a movement, right? And it's a constant uh, struggle, you know, uh, it didn't just happen once, you know, we're constantly having to, 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 to fight, right? Um, and sometimes these rights are taken away and they're given back. Um, and so what is the role the trans community played for the LGBTQ rights and movement? and particularly the black and brown trans women in this movement. Jupiter? Um, I will say that we wouldn't have pride today without the leadership of black and brown trans and queer, uh, well, black and brown trans women. Um, we wouldn't have what we have today. Um, and we can definitely see that in how the Compton's cafeteria riots of 1966 occurred and also in um, the Stonewall and riots as well. So, you know, 
trans people are pioneers of what we have come to know as the modern day um, LGBT movement. Um, you know, trans people have been the ones that have taken the stands, that have been at the front lines, um, have held that beacon of courage, um, of rebellion. And without that, it, it, it wouldn't have become what it is today. However, I do think that that is forgotten. It, it's definitely not recognized as it should be. Um, you know, Shane mentioned something about um, solidarity. Um, I also think it's important to make sure that we have solidarity within our own LGBT community. Um, because, you know, there, as we saw in, in, in the early years of the gay rights movement, um, black and brown trans people um, were sort of pushed aside. They were uh, outcasted from the movement. And that definitely began a pattern of not recognizing um, the work and the contributions of black and brown trans people. Um, and, you know, I feel like we're still uh, experiencing those consequences and that impact because uh, when trans people are being attacked and targeted, where is the rest of our LGBT community? What, you know, where are they? Um, and I think that's, that's quite important to know. And it's also quite important to remind everyone in the LGBT community um, what has come before us and who we owe um, our visibility um, to. Great, thank you, Jupiter. And Shane? I agree wholeheartedly with what Jupiter said. Like the reality is that trans people were at the forefront of starting the movement while simultaneously like being the most extreme target for hate and discrimination and violence. And, you know, that history was almost lost, you know, like things like Compton's had to be dug and found, um, you know, because so many of the people from that time, their voices were shut out or those that wasn't being reported in the newspapers because it was an embarrassment to the city that there was an uprising of queer people and that that riot started by black and tra black trans women and uh, women of color that were trans. So we live in a time where we can now really uplift that history and make sure that that doesn't get lost again, you know, um, because I, Jupiter said it, you know, there's so many people who fought ahead of us to make this possible. We wouldn't have an office of transgender initiatives without the like even physical fighting of the of the trans people who came before us. And I think so many of them, you know, aren't alive today to have even been able to fathom these kinds of concepts of trans people gathering, trans people in leadership roles. And so the more we can make a point to share that history, to honor that history, to uplift the voices of people who were around at that time to remind our community of those struggles, um, I think it's so important. Um, because again, without those people, without black and brown trans women of color and trans people, we wouldn't have all of the different things we have today. And there's such amazing um, role models for that, like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, like people who we even have documentation of them speaking about what that time was like. And I think that should just be highlighted anytime we're talking about the movement um, because yes, they really fought hard. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, when we talk about pride and the movement, we hear Stonewall, you know, so we definitely have to, you know, raise those voices of the trans community to make sure that it's in history, it's in our books, and it's in our consciousness. And, it, and it's a struggle. So hopefully we can lift those voices a little bit here today. Uh, Andrea, what are your thoughts? Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> You know, with, with uh, there'd be no same-sex couples mm -hmm. skipping down the street holding hands if it hadn't been for 
the stuff that uh, trans women of color had to endure. Um, and it's their um, strength that has led us to this part. I mean, in my opinion, um, you know, gay men would still be the Medicine Society and, and lesbians would still be the daughters of Belitis if it weren't for the, the heavy lifting that the black and brown trans women did. And when I say black and when I say brown, I mean, it was black and Afro Latinas. So let's don't, let's not get it twisted. <laughs> and they did the heavy lifting because they had nothing to lose. They had nothing to lose, so why not? And um, there's a moment um, in a documentary. I can't believe if the doc, I can't remember if the documentary is about Marsha or Sylvia, but um, there's a scene, it's called the Y'all Better Quiet Down speech. And um, it's Sylvia, it's soon after Stonewall and for like five minutes, all queer people were sort of together. And you can see the very moment in time where Sylvia's on the stage as a rally of gay people, LGBT people. And she's like so exasperated and she's so emotional that she can't get all of her words out right. But she's, it's, she's so happy that this is happening, that gay people are, are, are finally standing up and, and, and are together for a minute. And, and, but she was struggling a bit. And, um, and uh, the white gay guy came and took the mic out of her hand and dismissed her from the stage. And that was the end of the contribution of trans, uh, black and brown trans women and it was, it took 50 years for us to get back here to recognize what they did for us. You know, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, I know you mentioned strength, you know, so I know there's been a lot of violence, a lot of oppression, discrimination in the trans community, uh, and particularly the trans women. Where do you think that, that strength comes from? You know, is it because of, you know, that history? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Jupiter or, or, or anyone? You know, where, where, where does that come from? Where is that core? Um, I will say that I just want to reiterate what Ms. Horn said about uh, black and brown trans women just having nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. When you have nothing to lose, that is the fuel that is the source of where that courage and um you know that bravery truly comes from just knowing that there's absolutely nothing that you can lose so why not take a stance why not go all the way and i think that's important to remember no absolutely i'll also add like i think a lot of times that still happens today because it's an act of survival you know it, if it were as easy as being able to go through certain methods of attaining the things anyone wants in life, you know, it would be a different story. But trans people as a whole are under constant attack. And yes, absolutely more so for trans women of color or trans people of color, you know? So it's just a constant act of trying to survive that like kind of gets you in a mode to fight. You know, like when you're pinning people into a corner and not having options, so it, it feels like that's the only option, right? And then to some that might look aggressive or it might look like, you know, that's not the way to get things. But what are you talking about when the system has told a whole community that they don't belong and don't deserve access to basic needs? It's like fighting is an act of survival like just to get through the night for some or just to get through the next 
day. It's like all there is is to fight. So it's an exhausting way to be, you know, while I absolutely it takes courage and absolutely fighting looks like so many different things when we're trying to fight for basic liberties and 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 access. But, you know, I, I there's just so much fight that's still happening today. Um, and it looks like all sorts of things. It, the trans community is a community that is constantly fighting. Mm -hmm. that, that's important to understand, you know, for a lot of us um, to see, you know. Uh, so where do you think the trans community is today? Jupiter? Oh, or Andrea? Why don't you go ahead, Andrea? So I, uh, see trans folks are, uh, trans folks are the only group that people are trying to get out of, you know, a lot. I mean, there's a lot of us that, um, you know, are go stealth, right? Because it's, um, say, yeah, so it's because it's safer. And um, there was, um, I just wanted to say that, and then there was another, um, now the one who they think threw the actual first brick at the police at Stonewall was not Marsha or Sylvia. It was Zazu, the queen of sex. And she was a activist like Marsha and Sylvia, but she did a little better than they did. Well, they didn't mind sleeping together under a grate or under a bus stop. Zazu did, so she always had a little sugar daddy or something. But she's the one who threw the first brick. So just just for history's sake. Right. Thank you. You're going to give her her props wherever she is. Absolutely. Definitely. So. Uh, yeah, so I mean, following up, Andrea, uh, Andrea uh, there's a lot of gems that you have uh, provided as far as the historical concepts or, or just the history in general of the trans movement, right? And one thing that I found fascinating is that you have a book um, that I believe that you're writing or um, or is already published, but uh, I would like to know more about the, the, the book that you, that you have on the history of Black trans women that predate the cafeteria rights because mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 time frame is from 1836 to 1936 so i'm really curious to know some of the gems that i could fin i could finish it if i could get me a grant or something <laughs> that's why it's recorded <laughs> i don't know who to talk to <laughs> mama need a grant so she can go focus um yeah, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, there's his, you know, everyone has seen uh, Mary Jones um, from 1836, no? Okay, well, she was a black trans woman um, from New Orleans that was born in about 1804, and she made it, she was born, this is antebellum, she was born free in New Orleans, but she got busted for prostitution in New York in um, 1830, yeah, 1836, because that's when she became a public figure in 1836. And But how did, the part I'm really writing about is how did she get from New Orleans to New York during anti in antebellum America, and she was jet black and gorgeous, and so that's the really interesting um, part. But she did exist, and while um, I didn't think I'd be able to find many others other than her, I was surprised to find several other. Black trans women that have held their held their ground and represented themselves 
and um, represented us and made this future possible like Mary Jones, for example, she got caught. They said a, a robbery because she had several wallets in her apartment and each wallet had $99 in it exactly. So, but anyway, they said she stole them. But anyway, I grew up on Sherlock Holmes and that's a damn big clue to something else is happening. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, they tried to shame her in court and they called her the man monster because she was black and gender non-conforming. And uh, that, that was her title in the newspapers, the man monster. And um, she, the, the, the judge tried to shame her in court and she said, this is how I've always been. This is who I am. Back in New Orleans, I always was a woman. And, you know, she stood up to them, but can you imagine? And the kind of strength it must take to, in 1836, there's slavery going on in America. And she had the nerve to stand up for herself against a mean old white man, you know, in the courtroom. I mean, that's like an example of like strength. And it also kind of reveals to me this sort of place that trans people had in world history before that Western Europeanized version of Christianity has tainted the world. Yeah, our place, yeah. And his, I think, was to be the magical people. Right. And so, because I mean, just collectively, like Black history has been either been swept under the rug, has been erased, or has been reinterpreted. You think Brock built the White House? <laughs> <laughs> let, let him know, let him know. But I, I'm just curious. Uh, why do you why do you think, as far as with black trans uh, history, um, why was that part that portion? Because I'm this is the first time I'm hearing about it, uh -huh. um, and many of the people who are here. But why do you why do you think that's the that that was that's the case? Like, you know, for you to like have to like revisit and 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 to and to unearth, you know, stories like that. Yeah, ain't this miracle? <laughs> this, this miracle. <laughs> ain't nobody changed. <laughs> Being silly, but you know, it's painfully true. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I didn't know that there were we had transistors. It's a it's an incredible gift to be able to find about about Mother George in the 1860s, she was black and Indian and her family came from Maine. Her family was one of the um, founders of the state of Idaho. And she was a midwife and she delivered over a thousand babies mm -hmm. in her life. Half of them were Mormon. And she was part of a, her family, she was part of a black town and she was a very respected healer and no one knew her tea till she died. And um, then they, she got erased from um, Idaho history. But her family was one of the founders of, of Idaho. And then, uh, should I go on? Is there, I don't, I don't want to be a bore. <laughs> that that Please, is some amazing- go on. That Tell is, us about Lucy Hicks Anderson. Yes. Okay, so- um, <laughs> Her stories, and she's she's one of the people I'm writing about, and um, she was a really interesting character, and she trained. No one knows this. This is the part I'm writing, making up. She she trained as a chef, and where she trained was a place where cattlemen came and people that had just discovered oil. It was Nouveau Riche, Nouveau Riche kind of place in the middle of Texas where the cattle barons would come and they had all this money. And she cook, she was a cook there. Um, and they asked her, um, did she know where 
they could get some girls. And she was like, oh no, I, I don't I do not do that kind of thing. And then he gave her like several gold coins and she said, mm -hmm, yes. And so that very night she became sort of a madam. And um, so then she took her culinary skills and her, ma and her madam skills and she moved to California where she was running a daytime catering business for all the socialites between Santa Monica and Santa Barbara, that coastal area there. And they, she was the darling of the socialites. And then at night, she had her brothel. And the only reason she got, yeah. And so she had to, she stood up for herself in court too. And the only reason she got, um, went to jail, not, it wasn't because of the brothel thing, because Lucy, and Lucy Hicks Anderson had, because of her catering business, had tremendous connections with the elite and they would get her out of jail so she could come and do the party that night. But um, yeah, she, but she went to prison, she went to jail. Well, she didn't really go to jail, but she got sentenced to jail because of her marriage. And she had married a GI and she was getting his benefits while he was away. And that was the crime, the only crime they could bust her on. And um, yeah, but after that, she did okay. Yeah, she actually did, did okay. I mean, this is the type of stuff that 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 has to be heard, right? And like, I'm I'm just like, we can keep it going. We can have a five part series. <laughs> what do you guys know about Sir Lady Java, Sir Lady Java, Sir Lady Java. Sir Lady Java. I was uh, at her house a couple of weeks ago in LA. Sir Lady Java is the diva of all divas, and she's still living, and she was. She's about she's about eighty. She was the she her she was a performer like a burlesque performer in Los Angeles, and she had the most incredible body, and she was so beautiful, and um, but she kept female impersonation or or cross dressing was illegal, and when she appeared at black clubs, they would arrest her female impersonation. So she's she, with her ACLU boyfriend, they sued the state for this rule called plan nine, which was the one that they could arrest you for being an impersonator. But so sometimes she'd have to be on stage with the man's watch and, or she'd do her little sexy act, but it'd be a man's tie, you know, so she could pass, but still it was like a little sex bomb. But she stood up in the courts and she she eventually won. She, she eventually won after losing a couple of times. Plan nine was eradicated. So there'd be no sisters of perpetual indulgence without Sir Lady Java. There'd be none of us sitting here without Sir Lady Java Quise's cap. Well, some of us. And um, <clears throat> she is, I, oh, oh, and they're gonna make a movie of her life um, starring uh, Haley Sahar from Pose. You guys know who she is? The little mm -hmm. light skinned one from Pose. And that's, I, <clears throat> And Java is really happy about that. And she's that's, that's and she's really proud that they're doing that. And she deserves so much love and respect from from every LGBT person. I mean, she changed the world. And that's the title of my book. If I get a grant and I can go finish it somewhere, it's <laughs> How black, you hear it, you hear how it, black folks. trans women change the world. You hear it, folks. You know, <laughs> we, we, I didn't we, use a grant. Yes, we, uh, we, so gotta, we gotta do this. That important history. takeaway. Yes. <laughs> because because history is really important, you know, and um, really important. It's, it's really important because like the the way that we can empower ourselves and be able to move forward, right? And to 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 have movements continue 
the fuel for those yeah, movements is the history of where it starts at. Our ancestors. I mean, right. they didn't have no hormones. And you know, they were out there just working it. Oh. And and there were a lot of trans men out there too, mostly white trans men that were fighting in the Civil War and stealing. Right. One one was a fa one trans man was a famous horse thief, and all the ladies loved him. And when he went to prison. <laughs> they let him wear his men's clothes, you know. So, and, right. um, yeah, I mean, he was in a men's prison. That's right, and they were suspect. But yeah, there's so there's, right. um, that's volume two actually about the trend. Hey, listen, I mean, this is like all fascinating history. And, oh, and one know, of the um, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, but yeah, the night, there was this period in America. Oh, am I making it all about me? Am I being a bore? No, go, go, okay. go ahead. Uh, so, okay, go so, ahead. No. so then in the 19, there was this period in American history called the pansy craze. And it was in the 1920s and the 1930s. And so gay shit was in, right? It was also prohibition. And do you remember from those old movies um, there'd always be an old guy and they'd say, yes. Well, anyway, he was like part of the pansy craze. And they had this other phenomenon called womanless weddings, womanless weddings that started in the black church as fundraiser where the girls, transgender girls is what we would call them today, um, dressed as brides and bridesmaids and probably butchers and gay guys were the grooms and there were these big lavish wedding productions that people paid to go see like a show and they started in the black community but <laughs> you know everything black people start so then it went to the mainstream um world and it was a giant craze and world war it kind of stopped at the beginning of world war ii because you know America had a kind of another uh, had kind of another focus, but during this time, some of the biggest stars were trans black trans women making a hundred thousand dollars a million. One was making a million dollars a year, and um, they were well respected. Oh, oh, oh! So. <clears throat> Black trans women in the Black community, well, the working class Black community, because middle class Black people have never cared for trans women, but the working class Black community loved the girls. The, there was the closest thing they were ever going to get to sort of Hollywood glamour or anything, and they loved the girls. And this is going to be surprising, but it was Martin Luther King that ruined it for the girls because Martin, when Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement came um, in in the 50s, they went for respectability politics. And it was, always, it was all about having your, you know, your tie correct. And you know, we have to show the white people that you know, we're decent. And they kind of, and then the girls became persona non grata and it just changed for us. And um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was the civil rights movement that did the girls in. Isn't that funny? Mm. And so, because they were all like middle-class kids, you know, L A Martin Luther King and all his like henchmen and allies and lieutenants, they were all like, you know, went to those historical black colleges and were all like, you know, super bougie. And um, yeah, and so that was the answer. And then ever since the 1950s, 60s, uh, girls have just been sliding down and it's been getting worse simultaneously. And this is like an upswing, so I'm down. Oh, I mean, that's that's extremely fascinating, you know, when it comes to like civil rights, right? Right? You and know, then yeah, it's collective okay. economy. But I mean, speaking about the upswing, right, and, and the history that you're mentioning, uh, 
I know Jupiter last year, you were at City Hall uh, along with, uh, with other leaders uh, for the Transgender uh, Heritage Month uh, for, the, for the month of August. Um, I know we could, you know, we could talk about the explanation aspect of it, but, you know, for you being there and um, for your work in it, along with, with your, with your, with your, with your, uh, with your comrades, I'd like to know, like, what was that feeling um, when, when this was actually happening for you as well? Um, yeah, so uh, last year, uh, we got the mayor to recognize August as Transgender History Month uh, for its connection, for the month of August being connected to the Compton's Cafeteria Rights. But, you know, I will say that Trans History Month wouldn't have happened without all of the incredible contributions of uh, trans people, some of which Ms. Horn has highlighted, like Lucy Hicks Anderson, Mary Jones, um, Sir Lady Java. Um, you know, as I was doing my research during Pride Month, I sort of came to the realization that there, there isn't a month that really celebrates and commemorates transgender history. And I feel like something that is forgotten is that trans people have existed forever. Trans people have had a major stake in, in monumental events in history, as you know, Ms. Horn pointed out uh, that you know, the girls were did in during the civil rights movement. Um, that's just one example in which trans people have played a role, have played a part, um, yet it is virtually unknown. Um, so one of the thing, one of the goals of Trans History Month is that over time, we should continue and we should prioritize the dissemination of transgender history, um, uncovering transgender history and, um, you know, giving credit where credit is due. That is what Transgender uh, History Month is for. And we do have other uh, months uh, dedicated to uh, honoring the trans community in some way. We have International Trans Day of Visibility. That's only one day, it's not enough. Um, we have, you know, uh, Trans Awareness Month in San Francisco, but it's not necessarily anything other than a panel or two. Um, and there's also Trans Day of Remembrance, which in a way is uh, eclipsed by a sense of mourning. Um, and I think it's important that we must recognize that the trans community is incredibly rich in culture and history and community and r resilience and, you know, and I think that unless we recognize that portion, we will continue to have this narrative of trans people that will continue to, you know, place us in the back burner. But once we make the realization that trans people have always been pioneers, um, that is when conversations and that's when narratives begin to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much history here, you know, um, that Andrea had mentioned, individuals that really need to be highlighted, you know, they need, we need to be talking about that, you know, all the time. Uh, so we can really understand uh, the trans community and, and the struggle. Um, so where are we today? You know, how, where, where is the trans community today? I mean, there's some great things happening, you know, this legislation that passed. Um, Shane? You know, I think today, you know, the reality, like it's been mentioned is like trans history exists because trans people are around and trans people have been around in so many different cultures, you know? And sometimes we don't get opportunities to talk about that, but there are, trans representations in Mexico, in India, in the Hawaiian Islands, like there's identities and names for those identities that have existed, but have gotten lost with, you know, with, with wars and with people coming onto lands and taking over and shunning these identities as something that shouldn't be. And that still continues today, right? So there's a fight that's still going on 
but something that's happened to our benefit, I think, is the internet and the way I think that has benefited. You know, we see things like there is an uptick in terms of data of trans youth who are identifying themselves as trans youth. Um, this conversation has been coming up a lot and something I think about personally is I grew up in a time, you know, which was the 90s, not too long ago, but, you know, it was a time where I didn't have access to the word transgender. I didn't have access to representation of anything that I could associate as trans. I knew myself to be feminine. I knew myself to identify maybe as being attracted to men, which is a separate thing, but still, you know, just really rigid in terms of identifying with that at a young age. So now we're at a time where people are, youth in particular, are feeling empowered to say, I am trans or I am non-binary. I don't conform to the the, the hierarchy of, of gender that places power, you know, and I think that's incredible. You know, I think people having access to that language, to that identity is amazing because I think I would be a different person today if maybe I had access to that language. I'm just happy that other people can have it now. Um, so that's one really cool thing I think that's happening now with the trans movement. Um, and people are being able to get connected internationally that way, you know, having conversations with trans leaders around the world, um, creating models based on some of the things we're doing here in San Francisco, which is really cool. I think San Francisco has been at the forefront of a lot of different waves in the, in the LGBTQ movement. But I think now people are still looking to us to see like, what is San Francisco doing to acknowledge and uplift and celebrate community. And we are more able to have those conversations and potentially make impact in other parts of the world. That's amazing. Um, Andrea, you know, you know so much history. I mean, have things changed? Are they the same? You know? um, well, I would have or... to say they've changed a bit. Yeah, I would, I would have to say, um, I mean, I spent my teenage years running from the police in five inch heels, you know, hopping over fences. Um, so I guess things have changed. And every time I'm in a gathering, um, a trans gathering, I, I still am triggered by the fact that the police could come kicking down the door any moment and take us all to jail. I, I still live with that trauma. And um, so, yeah, you would you would think things were changing, huh? But <laughs> are they? That's that's the question. Um, you know, how are things? I mean, we just have to pretend like they are, huh? Yeah, Eric. Yeah, that's that's kind of the question. Is like, what's on the surface and what's really happening underneath, right? We have a a cultural district now in San Francisco, the first cultural district in the country. You know this legislation that has been put together i mean it it, it it looks like there's some great things happening a lot of great visibility for the trans community um yes um that is all great things that are happening underneath that still yeah no i just wanted to Go say ahead. that um i just wanted to say that yes the visibility is great but also um visibility sometimes you know visibility does not equate employment visibility does not equate having access to a home visibility does not equate um you know not having food insecurity and yeah visibility is great but there is still so much work to be done and that's also another um it's like a double-edged sword visibility is a double-edged sword just because you are visible does not mean that things are getting better um and that's also something uh you know with pride right now for example you know every time that pride month rolls around yeah pride corporations change their like banners and start doing advertisement uh you know to celebrate pride month but it 
every other month of the year when, uh, you know, the LGBT community is being targeted, when uh, uh, Black trans women are being murdered and nothing is being done, where is, where's that visibility? Where is that solidarity that somehow is manifested during the month of June? And that's also something that, you know, we should be discussing that just because there's so much attention on Pride Month and, you know, celebrations and, you know, corporations and companies, uh, you know, doing their pride spiel does not mean that things are getting better. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a mirage and it, you, it's so important to look right through it because if you don't, you sort of, um, you falter in your allyship, you falter in your um, solidarity and, and that's also when things get dangerous. That's good. That's a, that's a great point. Okay, go ahead. I think you're on. I want to add, yeah, like I absolutely agree with Jupiter. I think, you know, while at the same time there's visibility in one way, I think that has emboldened people with political power to flex their muscles in that realm in order to then further harm community, right? We're in a time where we see active legislation like in Florida, don't say gay. Mm -hmm. And while that might feel directly targeted at gay communities, that impacts the entire LGBTQ community. And, you know, I grew up in Florida, so, and I've gone back recently just to visit. And now I go there thinking, am I safe? And not only am I safe, how are the other queer people doing it? You know, how do they go to Publix to just go buy their groceries without feeling a target on their back? Because that's something I think we as a community have grown up with that feeling, feeling like you're either holding a secret or that something's wrong with you because the way the world has told you, you know, and we see that that people with political power are, are, are using that against us and trying to make a statement to then embolden other people to basically attack us or create spaces that are uncomfortable. So, you know, that's one example in one state, but then Texas is passing legislation to ensure that if a parent decides to try to affirm their child's decisions around, you know, being trans and what that looks like, they face being ripped away from their kid, you know? Um, these are the kinds of things happening on legislation today, you know, like, yes, we might have gotten through a Trump era, but I think that has then emboldened other people to mm -hmm. find ways to keep that hate simmering. And even I think just this week, there was a, you know, the drag, the drag storybook hour which has just been a modern thing where drag queens come in and read a book to kids, but is an awesome way to just invite representation and have conversations about what a drag queen is and what's gender. There was, an, there was a raid by, I believe the Proud Boys, a group of Proud Boys running into a library for storybook hour. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be that child or to be those parents, you know, we're already, scared about so many other things happening in our country, but then when political power is actively making these choices today, you know, I, I just want, yeah, like people can wear their rainbows as much as they want today, but I hope that they make calls to their legislators, have conversations around the Thanksgiving table, you know, actively support those in their communities or families that are out as trans because that's the way change happens. Mm -hmm. And so there's still so much work to be done. And I just wanted to make sure that God said. No, absolutely. Shane, I know you, you uh, do a lot of trainings. Do you think the trainings that you do in groups or one-on-one -on -one really helps the cause in general? I believe so, yes. So kind of my um, approach to my trainings. So I work for the Office of Transgender Initiatives. We're a very small office. Um, at some point this year, we were down to two. We just got we just got a new hire, and I'm so thankful for Kylan. Um, but you know, when I do my trainings, my kind of go to is to just enter the room with compassion, because I you know I think the way for people to learn is through empathy and storytelling, 
And so some of my goals in there are to just make myself a person as much as possible. You know, like I'm a person, you're a person. I think at the end of the day, we're all at some way trying to achieve happiness and also achieve respect. And even if there are disagreements, how can we find a space to work together, to get things done, to agree to disagree? But beyond that, the reality is that even if you disagree with whatever you may think about trans people, it, I also share the realities. Trans people statistically have a hard time getting employment, have a hard time getting housing, education, uh, healthcare. So with all these barriers, it's like, we need to make environments that are more welcoming. We need to set the example that allows a trans person to feel comfortable to go get their checkup medically, to go pick up their medicine, to apply for a job. You know, all the history and fighting has put trans people in such a constant, like, mm -hmm. like, it, like you have anxiety, you know? So I try to train people on the other side to be aware of those anxieties, to try to have a sense of empathy because you know, if you can just allow some leeway there for trans people to really have the space to share, to talk, to be, to have opportunities to, to, to have a job or to be a part of a project, you know, that's how we build a better place for our communities. So that's what I try to go to, you know. Um, and so far, it's felt helpful. You know, sometimes you won't get everybody. But I think the thing that I'm doing that feels really important is just setting a standard, you know, and thankfully through the city, there actually is policy around, you know, misgendering, which is a big deal. Mm -hmm. It calls out misgendering that if you misgender somebody that is along the lines of harassment. So you can't just be using somebody's wrong pronouns because you don't agree with it. That's the policy. And the reality too is just trying to explain to them that if somebody enters a space and they're constantly misgendered, they're not gonna wanna go to work. They're not gonna wanna feel, feel safe in that space or comfortable sharing things or doing projects. So just getting people up to par with like, these are the standards of respect. This is how you can continue to educate yourself even after this training, right? Because learning is constant. Um, but we're really lucky in San Francisco and hopefully I, I'm praying for that ripple effect, right? Mm -hmm. We have models here of like having a transgender district about giving trans leadership opportunities to speak on their experiences. I think hopefully, you know, what comes out of that is we can help set the standards for other cities who want to be by our side or other trans leadership around the world to be like, hey, you can organize and you can talk to your city officials, you know, that's some of the work we do at the Office of Transgender Initiatives as well. Um, our lovely Andrea, who's here, has helped a lot with that, um, being on the TAC, and I'm so thankful. But, you know, education is constant. You know, there are people who are still mystified by trans experience, even if they don't identify that way. And, you know, I will say, it, we grew up in a world that told us things were the way they were supposed to be. But even through that, trans people exist. I am still here. I was raised a Catholic, uh, Hispanic I'm background. I'm and I just think like, you know, I'm so lucky I got to be in the place where I am now. And it's getting other people to be like, you know, trans people are here. We're not going anywhere. We're talented. We're organized. Thank goodness. And yeah, you know, hopefully people can just see us as people. That's yeah. that's my main objective. That's that's yeah. great work. Uh, Gulen, I think you had a question. Yeah, I do. Um, I asked this to the last panelist, right? Because some of the highlights that you've uh, that all three of you pointed out is the capitalization of the trauma of 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 the of of your of your community um like what happened a couple of years ago with black lives matter and with george floyd's execution businesses flourished with so many signs of showing fake solidarity and you know and i know this is something that has been being reiterated uh among you all uh especially when it comes to pride month right um but I would like to know, like, you know, especially like with, with trauma, uh, like black people, when it comes to trauma, like ways that we heal ourselves is through spirituality, through music, um, you know, when it comes to 
when it comes to maybe other cultures, there's different motives of that. Um, I would like to ask, like, you know, just an open question, like, within within the community, what are ways uh, are you uh, are you all collectively working towards like healing the trauma? Like, what are some of the what are, what are some of the the, the cultures? What are, what are some of the the, the practices or, or ways that that you heal or release the pain? One of those ways, I think, is to get Miss Hornet Grant so she can finish your book. <laughs> that is one of the ways that we can uh, heal um, in, to some capacity because a lot has happened. Um, and that is also a way to move forward, to really assess the scope of, uh, of, of, of just uh, attacks and oppression on the trans community. And we won't really know it. Um, we won't really know the scope until we fully disseminate everything that has um, occurred to trans people um, and you know, our existence throughout time. Um, and that's 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 what I say is one of the ways in my opinion. Oh, Shane or Andrea, what are some of the what are some of the ways? Well, I just would I would just to like to say that um JK Rowling really sort of broke my heart. Um, when she came out sort of against trans women and um, yeah, that it just brought me back to what Shane said about it. I think it just being more visible and also put a target on our backs as well. Mm -hmm. But, and I mean, you know, Harry Potter was a place where, where queer kids could go and you know, imagine themselves playing Quidditch and, and being magical and and having fun and for her to take that away, it, it, really, it really just broke my heart. And then it has nothing to do with the question exactly, but it sort of, it sort of does. It's still the, the oppression that we're, that we're feeling. And when somebody with the kind of influence that J.K. Rowling has to spend her billionaire time, you know, trying to put down trans women. It's like, oh, so yes, so we're more visible, but now we got billionaires coming after us. Thank you. So we are at seven oh eight. Um, so you know, we've talked about the past and what's happening currently so how do you envision the trans community in the future how do you see it sure. well i think you know i i just envision a world where trans people can just exist you know they can have all the different jobs that they want to pursue they can go to school and be the people they want to be i just want trans people to be happy globally you know, I want it to be an issue where trans people aren't having to constantly basically be refugees in order to find safety and community. I, I want that trans people have the same capacity to travel the world, to find love. You know, we're constantly fighting for our basic needs. And I want trans people to have an opportunity to fall in love, to build families if that's what they want, to, to just be happy. You know, because I think with the constant fighting, it, 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 it can bring you down. It can, it can really wear on you, that trauma. You hold it. You hold it in your mind. You hold it in your body. And I want for trans people that they just have the opportunity to smile, to feel safe when they're being embraced by the people who love them. Um, that's what I want. I want it, I, I just want trans people to love and be happy. I know that's super dreamy, and I know there's a lot of work to get there, but that's 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 my ideal how about you jupiter how does it look like for you um you know i do believe that we are now i do believe that 
the power of trans people is undeniable. Um, and that is something that we see today. It is something that we um, are continually reassured um, every day. You know, trans people make up roughly 2% of the global population, yet we are um, extremely present. We are extremely um, vocal. Um, and, 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 when you, and when you acknowledge that um, as to how such a small population can have this much presence and this much power, um, for me, I definitely think that the future is incredibly bright. Um, I don't think that that in any way should um, distract us from, you know, continuing to be allies and to, uh, you know, hold folks accountable that do not, uh, or, or that falter in their allyship for uh, the trans community. Um, so, yes, I definitely do see a very a uh, bright future for trans people. And I will say that I'm incredibly excited for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. Minds of fantasy, um, you know that um, so-called trans folks can take their rightful places back in the world and mm -hmm. run shit like we were naming the babies, being the midwives, being the gardeners, being the advisors, being the religious figures. You know, we, we were important to that darn Christianity. <laughs> so yeah, that's my sort of dream where the word trans has no meaning. You know, it's, it's very interesting. It's just the basics. The basic human needs that we have is what I'm hearing. Um, last question before we go, there's a question in the chat. Um, what can others do to support the trans community? What can others? Oh, I, I'd like to answer that. Sure, go I, ahead, Andre. I, um, I saw a documentary of, with, about Mother Teresa do you guys know Mother Teresa? Yes. Anyway, everyone knows Mother Teresa. And so Mother Teresa said in the documentary about her, she said, people come up to her, to her all the time and say, Mother Teresa, you know, how can I help? How can I help? What can I do? And Mother Teresa said, you already know what to do. Mm -hmm. So that's my answer. No shade. No, <laughs> all shade. Yeah, I'm taking that. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's perfect. Jupiter? You already know what to do. Mm -hmm. That's that, yeah, just okay, Shane. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, like, if people really want to help, like, there really are some basic steps to take just in terms of educating yourself. I think being an ally needs to happen beyond pride. And the reality is that people have privileges that they can utilize to uplift the voices of trans people. The more we can do that, the better. But educating yourself is a constant thing. We're going to be doing that for the rest of our lives, all of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just being there for those who are trans and in your life now, support them, ask what they need, give them hugs, you know, figure out how you can better support not just that person, but that, their community. Um, there's so much that is taken away from us and that we're not given. So giving trans people the opportunity when it's possible, it makes a difference. Making those opportunities happen and finding ways for trans people to be uplifted, I think is a, is a great step in the right direction. Great. Well, we all heard it here, what we can do to support. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, it reads, uh, what does trans liberation look like to you? What does trans liberation look like to you? Uh, Shane, do you want to start? Let me think for a minute. <laughs> or anyone else can jump in, Jupiter, Andrea? 
Um, I will say, um, you know, as I mentioned, trans people are pioneers. Uh, we are leaders, we are trailblazers. And what I think of trans liberation is that the existence of trans people in a way is a challenge to the status quo. Um, it is a challenge to how uh, systems perpetuate disparity, um, inequality, violence, oppression. When, you, when I think of trans liberation, I think um, of not only, not only trans people having self-actualization, but also um, in a way, uh, trans liberation also means um, a breakdown of those systems of repression. Um, and when I speak to individuals that have a very narrow view of trans people, I always try to broaden that understanding to mean that uh, there are many more disparities and many more um, inequities in the world and that the existence of trap of, of trans people in a way is a challenge to all of that. Um, and I feel that's sort of like a gateway for us to begin to um, understand a very different world because these systems um, are not just harming the trans community, but they're harming other people. When you think of the way uh, that systems in place uh, continue to perpetuate um, um, you know, harmful environmental techniques. That is a threat to all of us. And this is what um, liberation should be, not just for trans people, but in general. But of course, trans people are carrying the torch. When we have conversations about, um, you know, access to uh, healthcare, gender affirming uh, services, along with that conversation, the follow up to that conversation is, well, what about Medicare for all? You know, that, that just to sort of, just to add context and background as to what it means to me for trans liberation and how trans people are spearheading um, this movement that um, questions everything around us in the way that we've been conditioned to live. Because if we, uh, if cis people are okay with it, if, if cis people do not face the hurdles, it just sort of is ignored. Um, but when we pay attention to trans liberation and what is happening to the trans community, we must be able to understand the big picture. Thank you. Uh, Andrea, what does trans liberation look like to you? Oh, um... Yeah, I, I'll just say what I said before. It was, where the word trans really has not much meaning. You know, it's not going to stop you from getting a job or a house or okay. a passport. Got it. Shane? Yeah, I think, I think liberation, what it feels or think or I think it would feel like it's just like having not having that feeling as there's constantly going to be a fight to be had or constantly going to be a fear of doing pretty much anything right whether it's something like Andrea said like getting a passport but also just like getting a job applying for housing approaching somebody to to make a connection whether that be romantic or a friendship but I think even with all the things we have here in San Francisco, I still live with fear, you know, doing things in this world or in the city, you know? So I think liberation for the community will feel like when that fear is no longer there and where, you know, surviving isn't, isn't the way that trans people are living. It's, it's thriving, you know? It's not a constant of like trying to get my basic needs met. It's more like, how can I bring even more joy to my life? How can I, you know, go for all the things I want to go for? I think that's a hard thing for us to have now. And I want that for trans people around the world. Great. Thank you. Goulet, did you, uh, do you have a 
closing question for our panelists? Yeah, I mean, we have another question from one of our uh, audience, okay. audience so, members. Uh, you blame progressives and mainstream LGBT group for letting conservative politicians get away with attacking transgender youth without a fight? Should we read that again? Uh, do you blame oh. progressives and mainstream LGBT groups for letting conservative politicians get away, let's see, get away with attacking transgender youth? Yes. I mean, we're seeing it with what's happening in Texas. Um, you know, this is something that I was saying a few months ago. I was saying that trans people are on the ballot. Um, you know, politicians are using trans people to push the political agenda. Um, when you think of what the governor of Texas is doing at the moment, you also have to acknowledge that he is up for re-election in a few months, you know? Um, and there's this new, there's this phenomenon um, that we are sort of seeing directly today is that trans people um, and the issues pertaining to trans um, individuals are now kitchen table issues. And the phrase kitchen table issues is that it, it then becomes uh, something that you discuss with your family at dinner. You know, that is how mainstream and that is how prevalent it has become. But because it's become that way, it, as a, you know, it's become politicized. And when it becomes politicized, you detach the urgency of such an issue and elevate it into, you know, just a political game. When in reality, there are trans people and their livelihoods that are being impacted and affected by this. So yes, I do blame um, in some way progressives for, you know, allowing um, the likelihoods and the lives of trans people to be used as, as political pawns that could sort of be then perpetuated in campaigns and such. Um, and, you know, I keep saying the word dangerous, but it is very dangerous. You, it, we are setting, um, the stage for, uh, you know, more uh, violence uh, and, 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 and oppression. And I, I, I also think that that's quite important to note. Um, and when we believe that, hey, this politician is on my side, you know, look at this, then no, it's, it's important to truly analyze where uh, they are coming from in the essence of the environment that they are in. Um, so that is just what I have to say. Thank you, Jupiter. Uh, Andrea, do you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, um, yeah. Are they progressive? <laughs> you know, Amy Cooper said that she was gave to black organizations, you know, the one from Central Park with the dog and the, but she said she gave, so yeah, I, I, I just, I just um, would like to see people sort of just acknowledge that maybe their part, in it's, it's no blame, it's just sure. history. Yeah, no one's yeah. blaming you. Yeah, I'm not mad at you, but it uh, don't pretend like it didn't happen. No, that's insulting. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Shane. I I I think that um, you know, as much as politicians have power or ability to make changes for the movement and the betterment of people, I think they should use that to be vocal about things that are not, that are wrong, you know? I think politics has become such a game to try to gain power instead of community representation for what's best for the communities that they serve, you know? You see people trying to go up the political ladder in order for their own gain or for, you know, to, to have that power 
without actually being considerate or acknowledging that they're serving communities of so many kinds, diverse communities. Those voices get lost and then people, you know, they don't feel emboldened when they vote because they don't see that as, as, a, as, a, as a real consequence of what can happen or they get so uninvolved because it feels like politicians aren't serving them. And I think for trans people, we see that happening. There's so much opportunity for people who are in politics to be vocal about like, this is not okay. These are the things we are gonna make sure as people feel like they belong. It's more like, oh, well, that doesn't serve me politically. So I'm not gonna do that, you know? And I, I just can't, for me personally, like I think if people are gonna enter politics, you know, <laughs> and obviously this is so tainted, but like, I would hope that those people want to do better for their communities, but we rarely see that. You know, we see people who want to go into the game of politics to play the game. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I really hope there's a resurgence of people who want to enter politics to do better. Because we do live in a time where there's technology, there's communication, and there's some real threats to the whole human population in a lot of ways, right? Like climate change, like that's real. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love that people that are in politics really utilize their voice, really talk to community about the changes that can be done today, you know? But it's bureaucracy, you know? It's this constant of like, we have to go through this channel, the emails have to be sent. Is this actually gonna benefit my thing, you know? So I, I really hate that that's the case when it comes to politics, right? I think politics, People who are politicians should be able to face the community when they're upset with them, you know, because they're really impacting people's livelihood, like Jupiter said. So I really hope that those who are either involved in politics in some way um, recognize the BS that's happening to trans people. How dare politics in other places say that they have the power to not say gay? You know, how dare other politicians who are neighboring Florida be like, that's what they're doing, <laughs> you know? I think that that's so, it, it upsets me, you know, and it's as it should. I hope that more people feel energized to be like, that's not okay. That like, that language is not serving the community I live in, you know? So yes, people should use their voices beyond Pride Month to be like, hey, rainbows. It's like, no, there are trans and LGBTQ ha attacks happening. Say something about it. They should use their voices. Yes. Thank you so much, Shane. This is a good uh, segue uh, for us to wrap up. I want to thank you, Shane, Jupiter, and Andrea for this fascinating conversation. I hope that we've been able to provide a, a, a platform you know, to be able to raise those voices for the trans community a bit. And we hope to continue those conversations in the future because I know it's something that we just can't do one day. You know, we have to uh, do it pretty regularly. I want to thank uh, our audience for attending today and for their questions. And I want to also thank Goulette, our co-host, uh, for, for joining us with the questions. Um, I just want to announce that our next annual Justice Poetry Jam uh, will be July 21st. It's called uh, Words Are Movements. So I hope everyone can join us uh, on the 21st for that, our second annual Poetry Jam. So again, thank you guys very much. Have a good night. I've been honored to uh, be here with you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.